somehow whoever did the work was able to neutralize gravity and and be able to you know and of course that sounds quite strange but that's the only explanation i can come up with because there are very few if any cranes that exist in the modern world that can move something of that scale one can probably pick up something that would be a thousand tons but would not have the ability to then move it a kilometer to its present location. There, there are no machines in modern times that can do that kind of work. everyone for a new episode of Star Views and today I'm here with Brian Forster. Brian um, is a traveler and an adventurer and Brian Forster also is a, a published author. He has written many books um, about the history uh, of, of humankind. You're also a YouTube uh, channel manager and you also have a popular Instagram um, channel and you can find all the references here in the uh, description of this video. Uh, so Brian, thank you very much. And the first time that I'm curious about is that uh, how did it start? Well, I developed a fascination with ancient places ever since I was a small child. Well, I've been to about 100 countries so far, but um, I moved to Peru about 15 years ago just because I was fascinated with the ancient megalithic sites in Peru that archaeologists, as far as I'm concerned, uh, couldn't properly explain because they said everything was done by the Inca, but we see evidence of a very advanced machining technology involved. And so obviously that wouldn't have been uh, part of the Inca culture. It had to be much older. And so since there was nothing in academic papers that could explain this, I started to study it all myself. And that took me to other locations, as you said, like Egypt and Baalbek in Lebanon and Petra in Jordan and Easter Island and many other locations. And so I've, I've written 37 books about these ancient mysteries and I think have 2,300 videos on YouTube now about it, mainly asking questions. I never describe or try to describe who did the work. I simply describe who could not have done the work. And I think that's quite obvious. As, uh, as time goes on, we had very successful tours as well of uh, Peru and Egypt and Bolivia and many other locations. And not one of the guests has been able to, or tried to uh, be convinced that it was the conventional cultures that did all of this ancient megalithic work, uh, you know, which is very gratifying. But basically, uh, you travel a lot and you go to places mainly where you can find these megalithic structures, or is there anything else that attracts you to, to travel uh, in other places? Yeah, it has been for about the last 15 years. Before that, I traveled extensively through Europe, um, mainly looking for my ancestral background because I, I come from many different uh, European cultures. And so I wanted to explore my roots when I was in my 20s. Uh, then I moved to Hawaii and was involved with Polynesian culture for uh, a number of years. But then my first trip to Peru is when I saw the megalithic work and I just, I, my eyes couldn't believe what I was looking at. Uh, my guide uh, on the first day told me that all the work was done by the Inca, but he couldn't explain how it was done. And that's, you know, that's the ongoing theme is uh, these colossal works in stone as well as astonishing levels of precision that could not be achieved with conventional hand tools led me obviously to conclude that we're missing a large portion of our history that is not documented in most academic books. I don't know in which area you live exactly, but what are the main sites uh, in Peru that uh, attracted your attention and, and why? Okay, well, I, I live on the coast. I live south of Lima, which is the capital, uh, in an area called Paracas, and that's where the elongated skulls um, are found. Uh, so I'm, I'm about a three-hour drive north of Nazca, where the famous Nazca lines are. 
But in terms of the megalithic structures, they're all in the highlands around the city of Cusco, which of course was the Inca capital, um, you know, north and south of that area towards, south towards Lake Titicaca, then into Bolivia. Um, but most of the megalithic work in South America is in Peru and Bolivia, most of it being in Peru with, um, you know, sites such as Tiwanaku in Bolivia, Puma Punku, which is part of Tiwanaku, but not much else in South America that I, that I know of. It seems to mainly be around where the Inca were living that you find these major ancient megalithic sites. What makes you think, as you said before, that the Incas were not responsible for building these structures? Well, they didn't have the technical capacity to do so. They were a Bronze Age culture. So bronze is actually a very, it's a complex metal, but it's very soft in comparison to the hard stone work that we find here in granite and basalt. Um, so what's most obvious is, is you see the work that the Inca did, which is relatively uh, simple, normally on top of megalithic structures like walls, which are far more precise and complicated. And so it seems quite obvious that the Inca discovered these ancient places and then built on top of them. Every time I, I, I see them, it just becomes more and more obvious that we're looking at two very distinct cultures. Even like for the famous site of uh, Machu Picchu, you feel there was an, another civilization before the Incas. Yeah, it seemed, it's quite obvious because uh, the very core part of Machu Picchu is megalithic, very precise, large stone work and then the other 95 percent of it is all a lot simpler in construction so it's very much night and day you can see once again that the inca discovered the site that we call machu picchu and they built a major city around this megalithic core that they found and the same at other sites like saxe waman and oyante tambo i know uh, reading some of your stuff that there is also a connection between the civilization uh, that built these megalithic structures and also the uh, elongated skulls civilization that were in the place where you live now. I don't remember the name, actually. Uh, uh, Paracas. Paracas, sorry. Yeah, no, we've been able to do uh, radiocarbon testing of the elongated skulls and also DNA testing of them. And they... They existed from between about 700 BC and 100 AD. So they were much, much later than the uh, megalithic work, but prior to the arrival and development of the Inca. When do you think these structures were built? I think at least 13,000 years ago. Okay, so, okay, <laughs> long, long, long time ago. What are the connections between Peru and all the structures that you found there and other famous places such as Egypt, for example. I know that you also travel extensively in Egypt. Yeah, well, you see very different types of construction because in e Egypt, everything is very linear. Um, so you have vertical surfaces and horizontal surfaces very precisely put together, such as the Great Pyramid for example, but then in Peru, it's much more polygonal and organic in feel. So I think they were completely different civilizations that may or may not have existed at the same time. But the more that I visit Egypt, the more that I travel in Peru, you can see that clearly there were at least two very advanced ancient civilizations who were, uh, were responsible for all of this work. Do we know who built the pyramids and how? No, we, again, I don't try to answer who did it. I can simply say that it, it was not the dynastic people because again, they didn't have the capacity to do that kind of work on that scale. The Great Pyramid by itself, and it's only one of eight or nine massive pyramids, was comprised of at least 2,300,000 multi-ton blocks. And the standard time frame is that that pyramid by itself was built in about 20 years so that means the um, quarrying, moving, and then putting into place one block every two or three minutes, which is clearly impossible over a 20 year time span. So again, I believe that the, the Great Pyramids and a lot of structures around 
the Giza Plateau area, which is quite extensive, and then also in other places like Karnak, were discovered by the dynastic people, adopted by them, and then renamed and reused by them. I'm curious though, like if you're doing all these travels there and you know studying these things and going there to see these things, you know, with your own eyes, I'm sure you must know also the academic literature about um, about the building of the pyramids, for example, among other things. And uh, well, if if an archaeologist was here, he would probably have an art attack right now, hearing that. Uh, uh, you're dating back the pyramids to a period that is pre-dynastic. Mm -hmm. Well, again, the problem is that they theorize as to how the, you know, for example, how the Great Pyramid was made, but they can't explain, you know, they they can't explain how that culture, the dynastic people, could have actually achieved it. They talk about, you know, thousands of slaves doing it, but the precision of the work is very advanced, and so it it's unlikely that it could have been done by a slave class of people. Also, a lot of the stone that makes up the Great Pyramid wasn't from the site itself. It was actually brought from Cairo. So that complicates matters in that you had to move all of that stone across the Nile River in order to get from Cairo to Giza. So it's all of these relatively simple questions that I don't find the academics can properly answer. They tend, of course, they say that theories like mine and those of you know other people like Graham Hancock are completely stupid and unfounded, but they can't answer the simple questions of how the work was actually done. They simply they theorize that this this is the number of people it would have taken, um, but I find their theories very unsatisfactory. One of the things that you lament, for example, in one of your uh, videos or your books, now I don't remember, is that actually the academics and the archaeologists even refuse to take on the subject, uh, for example, of, you know, megalithic sites or uh, the elongated skulls. It's not even that, you know, you disagree with them, but they don't do the study. Why do you think is that? Well, I think it's because they've been programmed in university as to as to the answers to these questions based upon what their professors told them before. Uh, you know, and that goes back to the time probably of, especially for Egypt, of Napoleon. You know, Napoleon brought 300 experts to Egypt to document everything that they found. But uh, yeah, I don't get into arguments with them because they simply do not wish to discuss the subject matter with me or the many other people now who are also studying the same work and coming to the same conclusions that I've come to about this stuff. When you travel to these places, do you usually, you don't go by yourself, but do you go with uh, scientists or geologists or archaeologists that can confirm or not your hypothesis? Well, definitely on the tours that we do, we always have a tendency to have at least one or two geologists with us and also normally three or four engineers from different countries. And they all have come to the same conclusion that the dynastic people could not have done the work. And when you have a geologist who's able to specifically find the source of the stone, like at where the quarries are, you're talking about um, a lot of the granite comes from Aswan, which is in the very southernmost point or uh, part of Egypt. So you're, you're talking the movement of multi-ton blocks of different sizes being moved up to, you know, more than 600 kilometers from the quarry to the location where we find them. And there's no evidence that the Egyptians were able to build large uh, boats or rafts to, um, you know, to move these these giant stones on the on the Nile, because there are no large indigenous trees that exist. The only trees that are really there are palm trees, and they're not very useful in terms of building large ships out of because it's a very spongy kind of material. It's not a hard wood. Uh, and then others say, well, the wood came from Baalbek or or from Lebanon the cedar, cedars of Lebanon, but then that's, you know, more than a thousand miles or 1600 kilometers to the north of Egypt. So 
you know, again, they speculate that that all this work was done, but they've never tried to build an actual uh, boat of, or raft uh, or barge of any kind in order to prove that this work was done. They rely on models and theories. Speaking of Baalbek that you just mentioned in, in Lebanon, what is it and why is that uh, interesting? Well, Baalbek is, a, is quite an incredible site. Um, it's located about three hour drive from Beirut. Um, and there you have the Baalbek complex, which is a, you know, a very large ancient complex that was built over three time periods. Uh, you had uh, a time period during the Crusades when uh, fortresses were built on top of older Roman constructions, on top of even older megalithic constructions. So you can easily see when you look at the site that there are three distinct time periods and styles of construction. The worst is the work on top because of course, building something like a fortress, you would have to do very quickly because you have to make it functional to fight off invasion. The Romans spent quite a bit of time there building some quite massive structures, but then the foundation blocks are uh, absolutely huge. There are uh, walls made up of a series of 400 ton blocks. And then you have the famous Trilithon, which are three stone blocks together, each weighing about a thousand tons each. And then in the quarry, which is about a, approximately a kilometer uh, away, you find two stones that are still in the quarry that were never finished. One of them weighs about 1,200 tons. And then recently they excavated one next to it, which is 1,600 tons. And again, the, the conventional ideas of how those large stones were moved from the quarry to the site of Baalbek itself don't make any sense whatsoever. They talk about, you know, like, like a giant cart was built in, you know, with wheels in order to roll these giant blocks, but um, there wouldn't be enough wood in the area to be able to build something of that scale. So again, you know, we can see how the Romans could have done their work, easy to see how the Crusaders did their work, but in terms of the Mount, uh, megalithic foundations, they're just, you know, just a complete, uh, complete mystery. You didn't develop any idea or hypothesis, hypothesis on how could they possibly move uh, a 1200 tons block of stone? I think it had to have been done by some kind of levitation. Um, somehow whoever did the work was able to neutralize gravity and, and be able to, you know, and of course that sounds quite strange, but that's the only explanation I can come up with because there are very few, if any cranes that exist in the modern world that can move something of that scale one can probably pick up something that would be a thousand tons, but would not have the ability to then move it a kilometer to its present location. There, there are no machines in modern times that can do that kind of work. Also because the terrain there is not flat, it's like kind of hilly. Yeah, it is, that's true, it is hilly. Um, you know, and again, when you talk about Egypt, you're talking great distances, you're talking quarries that are 200, 300, 400, 500 kilometers from the site that we, where we find the stone and in the highlands of Peru, it's very mountainous terrain. Like there are no flat areas. So the quarries, you would have to move the stone over mountains in order to be able to move them to the present location where we find the stone. And what kind of, you know, the, the Inca, as I said, were a Bronze Age people with no native trees that you could build anything of any scale out of, uh, including rollers, because the, the local trees do not grow straight. They grow, you know, in, in a like curved way. So there's, there would be no trees that you could make a roller out of that would move smoothly across the ground, up and down hills and up and down mountains. Interesting. Do you, do you know the uh, site of uh, Gobe, uh, Gobekli Tepe? Have you been there? Yeah, I was there three or four years ago. Well, what do you think about it? Because uh, we, we had a video on this channel about uh, Gobekli Tepe with Martin Sweatman. And uh, um, 
teaching physics at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, he was saying that according in his opinion, uh, because he carried on some studies about it, it was about he predicting the coming of some comets or astral events. Um, I don't know about that, but the other question that I wanted to ask you in connection with Gobekli Tepe is, uh, it looks like that all the ancient civilizations that built the, all these megalithic sites also had a strong, a very um, strong knowledge of, of the sky, of astronomy. Well, I, I think that's very true. A lot of, of ancient cultures were very, very knowledgeable about uh, the constellations and other things in the sky because that was simply part of their culture. And it's, an, it's a natural thing to be curious about what is beyond your planet. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is, it's a fascinating location. They've only excavated about 1 30th of what's there for some reason. I mean, the, the circle, the, the big stone circle you find there is only one of at least 30 or 40 that are still buried underground. Um, so it's fascinating to look at. It's been carbon dated at being at least 11,500 years old, which is twice the age of civilization as we know it. Um, the stones are not particularly well shaped. I mean, it, the work is quite crude, but you're still looking at a large sense of scale. Some of these pillars are up to six meters tall and weigh up to 20 tons a piece. The quarry is local, so it wasn't a question of moving the stone a great distance, but unfortunately the museum that's there states emphatically that the work was done by hunter-gatherers, which would be impossible. You would have to have a very focused group of experts to be able to construct something like that. Um, so again, that's another one of the problems with a lot of these locations is a lot of the standard academics give you a story that doesn't make any sense. So, um, and especially as I said, Gobekli Tepe is 30 times the size of what we can visually see. Um, and the Turkish government seems hesitant to do very much more excavation. I don't know why, but, um, you know, again, it's a location which is quite fascinating, but not, I wouldn't say used advanced engineering like we find in places like Egypt or Lebanon or Peru or Bolivia. What is the most stunning site that you have visited? The one that really struck you? Um, I would say the Giza Plateau is probably the most fascinating just because of the sheer size. And again, the tours that we do, we go all the way from the southern part of Egypt to the northern part of Egypt. And uh, what you can see quite distinctly is the difference between the dynastic work and the pre-dynastic work, because the dynastic work was all done in general in sandstone and limestone, which are really relatively soft stones. So those you could shape with bronze chisels or stone hammers or things like that. <clears throat> and the temples are all made in multiple sections. So like one of the pillars at, at Karnak or Luxor would be made of a series of pieces put on top, one on top of the other. But then when you see something like an obelisk, which you know, one of them weighs at least 400 tons. It's made of one single solid piece of granite that came from Aswan. And the finish is, it's almost like a mirror-like finish. So they were highly polished. Granite is a very hard stone. Trying to cut it from the quarry would be incredibly complicated. Transporting it would be very complicated. Shaping it and, uh, and uh, polishing it would be very difficult. Um, so again, I think that's the distinction. Also the pre-dynastic pillars that we find in some locations like at Karnak and Luxor are made of one piece of stone again, very hard stone. And then you have the dynastic stuff which, which encircles it or wraps around it, which is all made of multiple sections of, uh, of pieces of stone. So again, two very distinct styles of work. The dynastic work being complicated but far less complicated than the older uh, pre-dynastic megalithic work. Do you travel to Asia? Um, I have in the past, but uh, I wasn't looking at megalithic work at that time. I was, in, you know, I visited countries like 
Japan because I'm interested in the culture. I've been to Thailand and Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. Um, but yeah, there are some megalithic works in Japan. Uh, there are a lot of mysterious locations in China, which are off limits to tourists. Um, so yeah, uh, India is absolutely fascinating. It has some, some work that would be almost impossible to do today. There are large cave systems located there, again, in very hard basalt stone that would have taken hundreds, if not thousands of years to work just because of the hardness of the stone and this, just the sheer scale of the constructions. It looks like the farther we go back in time, uh, we find uh, sites, megalithic sites, that are far more advanced than the ensuing uh, history of the Egyptians or the Incas and so on. Uh, so it, what is your idea about who built these things? Did you make up your mind about any hypothesis? Uh, no, my mind is very much open to it. I mean, uh, when people talk about lost civilizations that could have done the work, we don't have any physical evidence of them existing. People, of course, talk, you know, there have been more books written about Atlantis than probably any other subject, but there's no physical evidence of Atlantis ever existing. You know, some people say it was in the Caribbean, some people say it was Antarctica, you know, all sorts of different locations, but I haven't seen any physical evidence of an advanced civilization called Atlantis or anything else having existed. Um, of course, the world's oceans did rise by more than 100 meters around 12 to 13,000 years ago. So there could be a lot of evidence which is underwater, you know, in less than 100 meters or so depth that uh, has not yet been explored that could excuse me, help us find locations for an advanced civilization or two. But I'm also open to the idea that it could have been visitors from off the planet who came and did this work for some reason, and then either left on, on purpose or were forced to leave due to some sort of cataclysmic activity. So I'm open to everything. It's just, I like to go where the evidence points. And at, at this point, I don't see evidence of uh, any specific civilization on Earth being capable of doing it. So I'm, I'm open to the idea that it could have been ancient, you know, extraterrestrials of some kind. We still need to infer somehow that there was a, a global ancient civilization that was able to, uh, that possesses, uh, possessed a technology that uh, we don't know anything about and possibly we are not even able to replicate today. Um, Brian, uh, are you going to ever travel to Italy? Um, I was in Italy about four years ago and I on the way to Egypt and uh, I've been to Italy. Is there anything, that. anything interesting in Italy to see uh, from this perspective, megalithic sites? Yeah, there are locations um, west of Rome and Florence, which um, appear to be very ancient megalithic sites, which are prescribed to being possibly Phoenician, I, I believe, but I don't think that, again, that the Phoenicians or any other culture had the capability of doing that work. There's some very massive uh, megalithic, monolithic uh, locations in that area. I think of, you know, West, part of, uh, of central Italy, which um, are quite puzzling, as well as in Greece. Uh, it looks like the Parthenon itself was built on top of an older megalithic construction, because if you see photographs of the whole um, Parthenon complex, you'll see that the vertical surfaces of the Parthenon below the temple appear to have been shaped by some kind of advanced machines. Awesome. There would be so many, so many things to talk about. I also know that you have some uh, hypotheses about, you know, the cataclysm that the, in the past maybe uh, disrupted this uh, global civilization. But then maybe we leave it out for for another day because um, really there are so many things uh, and we don't have much time. Um, but uh, Brian, uh, thank you so much uh, for for your time today.
Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I look forward to, to going back to Italy at some point and being able to have a look at some of these ancient works that I've, I've so far I've only seen photographs of them. And uh, I don't know many people who have documented them, but clearly there seems to be evidence of a very advanced ancient works which uh, predate, you know, predate the known civilizations that we talk about in Italy, as well as those that are found in uh, in Greece and, uh, you know, other locations, like I was saying before, Petra uh, seems to be a very complex pre, you know, pre-civilization construction, which is uh, 12 kilometers long. Of course, it's famous from the Indiana Jones film, but it's an absolutely immense site. I had no idea, but when I went there, um, I was astonished at the size of its construction. The famous little bit, uh, which is in the Indiana Jones film, represents maybe 2% of it. It's absolutely huge. The fact is, there are so many things that we don't know about our past. And yet, if you know, an independent uh, researcher like you uh, addresses some of these subjects, is maybe faces ridicule, you know, because uh, the academia doesn't, um, for some reason, is too, I don't know, is too conservative. Well, very much so. And I'm very pleased that I've been able to influence um, a number of people who now have uh, YouTube channels. One is Uncharted X. Another one is uh, Bright Insight by a guy called Jimmy. Another one is uh, a lady called Johanna James, and they've all been to the locations, especially in Egypt, that we've been discussing, and they, they come to the same conclusion. So I'm very happy that I've been able to influence younger generations of researchers who are <clears throat> seeing the same things that I do, asking the same questions that I do, and have come to the same conclusion that the work could not have been done by the standard cultures that we normally attribute to these works. Yes, well, I've been following you for, for a while too, and I'm very happy that I was able to, to talk to you today. And of course, if you ever come to Rome, um, I look forward to it, and maybe we can go visit the, the sites together. Uh, Brian, uh, again, thank you very much for your time. And uh, um, please, if you enjoy the time with us today, uh, uh, click on the on the buttons below, like and share and subscribe. And till next. Okay, thank you very much.